This is UXK. 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 I'm your host, Lee Allen Arredondo. This week, I'm talking with Tori Podmajerski about her new book, Strategic Writing for UX. It's all about driving engagement and conversion and retention with the words that you are putting in your experience. Tori is not only an expert at UX writing, she's also an expert at getting those words into the experience, which is half the challenge sometimes. Even if you've determined what the right thing to say is and where to put it, getting the rest of the team to see the value of that can be harder than it should be. So of course we talk about that. Uh, We also talk about how to incorporate that into your team's process, how to measure the effectiveness of your writing, which is equally important, and how to prove out the value of effective UX writing to your stakeholders. I want to mention that this is not just for writers because uh, we have so many people on our teams who are either responsible for or contributing to the writing in our UX. So I believe that this episode is really important for anyone who works on user experiences. Tori's written UX content for Google, OfferUp, Xbox, and Microsoft. She also teaches, she conducts workshops, and she speaks around the world. So I'm very happy to have her join us for a chat on UX Cake today. Really quickly before we start, I'd like to ask you to help us by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcast or Google Podcast, if that's your thing. It really does help us spread the word. You can also help by following us on Twitter and LinkedIn and sharing our posts with your network. Let's get started. Hello, Tori, and thank you so much for joining me on UX Cake today. Thanks for having me, Lee. I'm super excited to talk with you about words in UX because they have such an impact on the experience. Like you say in your book, words make an experience work. And it seems like more often than not, the writing is just kind of tacked on at the end if it's even really thought through at all. I'm guessing that you've seen that happen as well. Does that have anything to do with your your writing this book? (laughs) It has a huge amount to do with why I wrote this book. The words in the UX often are tacked on at the end or or just, you know, placeholders are put in and then, oh, we'll get to that before the end. And then, of course, more and more needs to be done bef- that ever wasn't anticipated before the end. So there's an enormous amount that just piles up and piles up, and then the time to work out the text shrinks and shrinks while everybody is still saying how important it is. And that's not a great way to make a great experience. Absolutely. And you've been doing this for a while, so you've seen, you're the expert in seeing how teams put it off. Yeah, I would like to say that all of my teams have uh, quickly come to understand how important it is and how powerful it can be when it's worked on early. But the reality is sometimes that that still hasn't been happening and it is increasing that people understand it through the industry, but a lot of us have to still advocate for for sort of the good hygiene of understanding your text at the same time you are understanding your interaction. Right. Yeah. And there's so many useful and <laughs> wonderful things about your book, but one of them is how you're talking about kind of a different process. And I want to get to that, but before we talk about that a better process for UX writing. Let's talk a little bit about who's doing the writing because it varies a lot across organizations. But in my experience, having a dedicated UX writer is even more scarce than having a dedicated UX researcher. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. So the people doing the writing right now are mostly designers for teams that have dedicated design. I mean, we we tend to forget in UX world how many teams don't even have UX design in-house. So for teams that have UX design, mostly they or their product owners are writing most of the UX text. Sometimes it's the engineers. Sometimes it's the CEO. So it's usually it's the person who is the most passionate about it whether or not they have the most facility with it. Very similarly to how UX design was done in the early days of the internet and applications, 
when it was the people who really had strong feelings about color or layout or typography that didn't necessarily translate into great experiences. Right, because they haven't, I mean, they have passion, but they don't necessarily have education or practice. <laughs> right, or have consumed the research that is really extensive now about what works and what doesn't in UX. And when you dig into that research with a content lens, you see that an awful lot of it has to do with the content itself, like almost everything about clarity includes not only information architecture, but the labels and descriptions and availability of the information so that people can understand what's going on. When those things aren't worked out in a systematic way, then it's kind of a hodgepodge and people notice. Well, let's talk about that hodgepodge a little bit, because inconsistency in terminology and voice, I feel, is one of the most common issues that I've seen in evaluating. I've evaluated hundreds of user interfaces, and a lot of it is inconsistency in terminology. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that also. So let me ask you, does a team need one person to be the owner of the UX text, or can it still be effective and shared by different people? That's a great question. I think that different teams have, like, the ways that humans can work together effectively are almost endless, right? Like, humans are really neat that way. However, it often, in the things that are the same in our various corporate environments, when it, the text and the terminology doesn't have, like, a solo advocate, and sometimes that advocate is much more like a janitor of words, like, oh, I'm just going to sweep up around the edges. Like, I know you really meant this word, but you used this word instead, so I'm just going to clean that up for you. Or it's somebody out in the front championing it and, and spearheading getting things correct. Usually it takes a person interested in it and capable of taking that on. Uh, otherwise, you end up with hilarious examples, like one of my favorite in real life examples is about terminology that overlaps in, in weird ways. So I live in Seattle, and at the North Seattle College, there is a building, and the buildings have different names. There is a building called the Education Building, and there is a building called the Instruction Building. Somebody Oh, that's named... not confusing at all. <laughs> no. And... and <laughs> Like the, the lettering on the building, you know, this enormous lettering attached to the outside is in the same font, apparently applied at the same time. I don't know if one was built after the other, but somebody could have done some disambiguation work in their terminology <laughs> at some point, but no. Yeah, so it's happening everywhere. It's not just yeah, uh, it's, apps it's, and sites. And <laughs> it's not just digital UX. It's also in real life. And right. like when you go to Georgia and Atlanta, and every street is called Peachtree Street or Avenue <laughs> or Lane or Place or some combination of Peachtree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, every city has its quirks. You, that is for sure. Absolutely. Um, and I got to say, we could do a whole episode on signage in Washington and how terrible it is. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so true. Uh, so let's, let's get back to something you touched on a little bit and I think is such an important part of, of this book. It was written in a way that was... Uh, kind of eye-opening to me. Uh, I'll tell you why after you sort of explain it to us. <laughs> <laughs> You're suggesting from the very beginning a real shift in our process, in the UX process. So you say UX writing is more than fixing the words, and you alluded to that earlier. You said, you know, we need to have a more systematic approach. And you're presenting this idea of a UX process that actually incorporates the UX writing from the very beginning of design. Yeah. Um, so you write about content first design. Tell us a little bit more about that process. Yeah, the idea here is that, or the central idea is that the fundamental way that humans communicate with anything is as a conversation, like you and I are having here. And we do this reflexively. Some of us do it more than others. Like, I have little conversations with my car and my cat. We have these conversations because 
the fundamental way we understand the world is through that interaction with it. And there's pieces of conversationalness that are the same for humans all over the planet in every language, like even the pause between turn-taking in conversation. So from that premise, the way we use conversation is like there's body language and there's all these things, but if we have to distill it down to its essence, we use words. Like if we need to communicate information, we use words. So if we start with the conversation that people are having with our interfaces and the interfaces are having with them, then we can map out sort of the pace of that conversation, the direction of that conversation, the sequence of that conversation, and adjust it and really do the design work there before that we even imagine a screen and then distill it down to really a, a frequently fewer screens and much more relevant information presented in a, a sequence that people find more palatable. So in the book, I outlined a, a kind of process that you can do with your team and with even with users of the, the eventual product, where people essentially stand up and talk through the conversation, really saying, OK. And so onboarding is a great example of this. Like If somebody is coming into your experience for the first time, it's really easy to use the metaphor of somebody coming into a room for the first time or a house. You know, what is the crucial information? How do we make them feel welcomed? Like, what are they there for? How do we determine that rapidly? Having those conversations and then continuing to play act those through uh, and recording it is one way to really distill with the entire team. Here is the progress we want to make. And here is the experience we want to distill on a screen and ship to millions of people. Yeah, and so I'll tell you what was eye-opening about that to me. I think, and it, it relates to something you said a little bit back about looking at research through the lens of content. So that process that you described, when I saw it, how it plays out uh, in your examples, what you describe sounds like kind of my preferred process for nailing down the user flow, which is that you sit in a room with your team or some part of the team and actually walk through the steps of that entire flow. So in that way, you can pull the user stories out of that. And so it's a quick way to create all the major scenarios in a flow. And then you, you know, proceed to either wire flows or wire frames. But so what's different about this is thinking about that flow like a conversation and actually mapping out that conversation for the UX writing to come at that point, which it just sounds like a really powerful approach. Have you found teams are receptive to this approach? Yeah, I have found they're receptive to it. I think that every team has its own limit for how much effort they're willing to put in at any given moment and how weird the behavior that's going to be expected. Like if it's oh, we've never done it before, it feels really weird, it feels unusual. Like, there's ways to get teams comfortable on it. And once they're comfortable with it, they're like, can we do that again? That I felt really good about what we ended up with because we were all on the same page. So getting teams to start doing it is a little bit harder than getting teams who have already committed that kind of energy mm -hmm. to it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But Anything I, new. <laughs> and do you suggest, right, I, uh, like suggesting that to the PM or the designer or, you know, like where does this usually come from and, and who owns it? Well, I think that that really depends on the team. So I've seen it owned by the designer who was already going to do this, like, as you described, the same activity of let's walk through what this would be like. And so this just and adds one layer of like, well, what language are we using? Would you really say it that way? Hey, that was a great way to say it. Write that down. And so it doesn't need to be quite as formal as I uh, laid it out in the book. So in the book, I needed to say like, and then you do this thing, and then you write this on the whiteboard, and then you adjust these post-it notes. And that is a process that will work and could work a little better if adjusted slightly for most teams. 
So it, it really just adds that one layer. And in fact, having, you know, if there is a, so when I'm involved in it, I'm coming to it with the writing expertise. And I'm saying so, like reflecting to the group after this, like, so here's the conversation as I see it. Like the UI, the person comes in and the UI says this and the person says this and, you know, and we can walk through the summary very, very quickly and really get a gut check on like, are we going in the right direction? Are we setting the right expectation? Like, do we feel good about, like, have we set them up for success in their next steps? So having that as a, as sort of an add on to an existing process or for teams that aren't walking through their UX flows at the very beginning with their customer journeys and their tasks, maybe it's time to start doing that. And if it's hard to do that, you know, going straight to wireframes or, or if the team, maybe a mythical team, has an idea that designers are there to make things look pretty, then, you know, backing up and doing that with the product owner and, and you know, instigating from the side to say, here's what we need to be able to do to walk people through this. I have even used as leverage to get people interested in doing these things, the, used the tool of, we will have to ship help content and we will have to ship scripts for support people to use. So I need us to be able to like, so can you walk me through what we're supposed to do and I'll take really good notes. And then when I flip those notes back to them and say, this sounds like the conversation we're having, and people make these very sad faces and go, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't really feel like that. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, it can. But we can work on that and we can make it better. And then it turns out then that that help content and those the how-to articles that help build people's confidence to get in and try it for the first time can be a lot sweeter and a lot more inviting for the people who need it because you've th had to think about the whole flow. Yeah. And I really like your suggestion of kind of thinking about the way you approach suggesting this, you know, maybe calling it a new process isn't <laughs> the right thing for your team, <laughs> um, but instead, you know, bringing it to the product owner as a way that the whole team can help that product owner do part of their job better. Mm -hmm. Besides being creating a more effective design. <laughs> Let's talk for a little bit about measuring effectiveness because you have a really great amount that you talk about this in your book. And it's something that measuring effectiveness in UX in general, a lot of folks have trouble doing. It's a topic mm -hmm. of a lot of conversations, <laughs> but uh, you have a great chapter on this. So let's talk a little bit about how we measure the effectiveness of UX writing. Yeah. So what I laid out first and, and in the book, I think, I hope that it's clear that in order to measure UX effectiveness. In, in order to measure UX writing effectiveness, we need to measure the UX effectiveness, which means we need to understand the goals that we had for it in the first place. So for a piece of UX at the beginning of, a, of the engagement process, like for onboarding, then we, or for like, say we've got an app and it has several critical user journeys, but maybe not every user will have every journey, right? Maybe they are frequently used, but by different people at different times. We may want to measure like, hey, of the people who start using the app, maybe they have to authenticate or, or whatever it is, how long does it take them to take their first one of these critical actions? Or how long does it take them to take all of the critical actions, right? Like different apps, we would use different measures for that. And then we should be able to ballpark from user research, like how long should it take? Like when people come to this, what do they want to do? Why would it take them longer than X amount of time? So you first need to have some idea of where that should land. 
and then have an ideal sense of like, okay, we, we expect it to ideally take this much amount of time in the very best case. If we did an awesome job, people would never notice it and it would be milliseconds. Great. If we didn't do a great job or there was other technical difficulties, maybe it would take five seconds. Or gosh, it takes them five minutes to find it. Right, like we should be able to measure that, you know, define it and measure it. And then as we are making changes to the UX, measure the impact on that change. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense to me. And um, <laughs> so I want to, because one of the other things that you talk about is, besides just measuring it, is making sure that what you're measuring is in line with what the product owner or what the business, the metrics that they are looking to impact. And so talking about this onboarding experience that you just, uh, as your example, just to sort of explain this to the audience, the product owner would be using, are you suggesting that that measurement would be um, tied to a metric that the product owner would be, you know, caring about? Yeah. Like if we are, so my, in my experience in UX teams, if we are ever measuring things that the business doesn't care about or that the product owner would rather ignore, that that's sort of a recipe for a terrible relationship overall. Understanding what the product owner is there for, even if it's something as banal as, you know, dollars, people spending dollars, great. What are the things that we can, with all of our UX knowledge and, and what we know about human behavior, we know in general that when people are happy and engaged with things, they tend to engage more, right? Like if they have intrinsic interest or even extrinsic interest in something, they will come back, they will feel better about it. If they feel squidgy about it, then they might think twice more often before spending those dollars. So we're in the business of making those things feel good or at least feel appropriate. I'm not suggesting, you know, introducing evil patterns so that they feel good when they shouldn't, but creating those feelings intentionally and, and knowledgeably. And then being able to stand on that and say, hey, product owner, you're looking for ways to increase these dollars spent and I've identified things using UX heuristics, using UX writing heuristics, that mean that people might be getting to this dollar spending point and feeling confused or feeling like they're not sure about what would happen next or that they, they aren't sure that this is better than some other competitor experience. And if, we've, if we can look at it, uh, an experience, not just from the numbers, but use it, using, those, using that UX knowledge and say, we have these opportunities for improvement, and I think they would affect these metrics. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think extrapolating from that, you can't just stop at measuring the time it takes for onboarding. But you have to tie, you know, there may be a bit of work that you have to do to show how that measurement would impact uh, the engagement measurement that every product owner should be <laughs> measuring yeah, absolutely. or caring about. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you talked just a minute about heuristics, which you have just a wonderful, wonderful set of um, it looks amazingly helpful, a set of heuristics for UX writing in your book. And I have to say, so I'm just curious your experience with this. So when I have taught UX research, and I know you teach also, for some reason, this is one of the most difficult methods for students to understand is the heuristics. And I'm curious if you've seen that. It's funny. I have not. So... In my class at SVC, we have been working on uh, sort of class after class. The main focus of it, we've been working on the Orca Card website, 
which is, <laughs> yeah, Lee, you're laughing. <laughs> so, it's so awful. It's, it's really pretty bad. It's not as bad as the good to go site, which I tried to use one year and it was too hard to work on. The Orca Card website is the, for the Puget Sound area that Seattle is part of, is the one regional card for all public transit, whether that's the state ferry system or the buses or light rail and like seven other local agencies. And working on that, I've been introducing heuristics just in that context, but not as a separate tool. I will say that years ago when I was a high school teacher, I would teach using heuristics so that people could learn how to grade their own science papers <laughs> and learn to improve from them. So yes, super hard to teach. And providing, yeah, I think the very hardest part is that people feel weird about assigning scores to things. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's exactly what I was wondering when I was thinking about this and talk, thinking about talking to you about this, because I think you might've mentioned it in the book too, that um, it is, it is a bit subjective. And I think, especially when someone is learning UX, they often aren't comfortable you know, give, giving themselves credit for their judgment on what is um, meeting a measurement or not, or a guideline. That's why I, I was tried to be as straightforward as I could in the example that I gave in the book for this, because I think the way to learn how to give these numbers in this very subjective way is to see exemplars of it, is to see like, oh, that could get it, like, it is okay to just assign a score to this. And I think, so one of the questions I got from several of my technical reviewers is, but what does it mean to have a score of, you know, I think it was essentially 75%. And the, uh, for the example I give in the book, and the purpose of the heuristics is to do the thought process of what would it take for this to be excellent what is it not doing right now that it seems like it should be doing? So the, the numeric score, I actually toyed with the idea of just giving it a three-point score, like a yes, no, or meh, mm -hmm. or you know, one, two, three, mm -hmm. because those are easier numbers to pick from. But giving it, giving it some sense of numbers, doing it a few times, people will, will practice, and they'll figure it out. I have confidence. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I think that you do explain it really well. Uh, some people maybe are caught up in just the, the name, <laughs> heuristics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, um, a disease or something. But <laughs> it's yeah. really just, I mean, we really should come up with a more user-friendly term for it. But it's really a, si a set of measurements. Yeah. Really. Yeah, it's guideposts, mm -hmm. qualitative guideposts. Right. So real quick, before we have to go, let's say that there is a designer or researcher or writer, who, whoever it is who cares about having more effective copy, they go ahead and evaluate their site or their app based on the recommendations in your book, which I think are really spot on. And so it's people should be using your book, <laughs> recommendations <laughs> Thank in your you. book. And so they determine that they have some real usability issues and, you know, determine specifically what they might be. So some of these, the issues maybe could even be tied to a metric that the product owner does care about, but they can't get the product owner or whoever owns the schedule to see making those changes to UX copy as valuable changes that would actually affect the metric, you know? Because sometimes the business or product owner is just really uh, focused on whatever is going to move the needle. And so, you know, a lot of what UX is about is can be incremental improvements. So what would be your suggestion for that person? I would have a sort of set of suggestions. One of them is to, and I think most importantly, is to be very, very brave about presenting the, the changes possible and advocating for it and saying, absolutely, without equivocation, this will change and improve your numbers, 
right? And even say, like, if you have a gut feel that it's terrible and I can make it better, even if I was half asleep, right? Like, it's so terrible, everything is going to be an improvement from here. Tell them it will improve it by, you know, 40%. You know, maybe that's not realistic. Actually, it was realistic for a piece of UI that I worked on, and the vice president who owned that piece of UI said, this isn't going to make a difference at all. I don't know why you're even fighting for it. And I was really gleeful when I showed him the chart that showed the, like, 36% improvement in conversion on that page. And it's okay to be gleeful about that. I think, so one is advocate. Advocate out loud and be brave about it. This does make a difference, it does matter, and it does matter in the bottom line. Another thing to do is to find out, besides the person who is stonewalling you, who gets to make changes? Who gets to decide, yeah, I just figured we could do a thing, so I, I suggested that change and it's low weight, so we'll, we'll just do it. Those people are frequently the engineers, whether those are the engineering leads or the engineer who you always respond to their error message requests really quick and they know that they, that they owe you big. Mm -hmm. Just say, hey, you're already in this code base. How much work would it be to put these in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking, um, being an opportunist for improvements. Yeah, absolutely. And creating the relationships so that those opportunities can be leveraged. So it's also a matter of playing the long game. So first, advocate. Second, do an end run around people. And third, play that long game of saying, oh, you're going to do your quarterly planning, you're going to do these things in this. As soon as, like, you know, you, you say, where in your planning cycle are you the most vulnerable to including great ideas like this? Like, where would it be hard for you to say no? Hmm. And not just be a jerk about it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I love that <laughs> idea. It's different than what I was thinking when you said long game, because often we have to, you know, prove the value of these changes by doing it to one thing, like your experience of, you know, making the change to one page and seeing that 36% increase. But I like that idea of, of looking at, at the planning cycle in general to see when would be a good, the most optimum time for presenting these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And building the coalition along like that planning cycle usually involves more people and people in general need to appear very reasonable in them. So taking advantage of that. <laughs> so well, very good advice. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad I asked you that question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> well, Tori, this has been so interesting and your book strategic writing for UX is so helpful. So I hope that a lot of teams are going to read it and take your guidance before we go. Do you have any uh, upcoming events that you'd like to, that you're speaking at, uh, that you'd like to pr promote? Sure. I will be speaking at the content strategy meetup here in Seattle on August 8th. I will also be speaking in October in Seattle at the Seattle Interactive Conference. Uh, I think that's the 15th and 16th in Seattle in October. And then right after that, or two weeks after that, I will be at UX New Zealand in Wellington. Mm -hmm. And I'm super excited for that. I have never been to New Zealand. Oh, that sounds lovely. Maybe they'll invite UX Cake there next year. <laughs> I think they should. Yeah. I think they should too. <laughs> awesome. So how can people connect with you online? I think the easiest way is on LinkedIn. I'm also the only Tori Podmajerski on the internet, so I'm super easy to find. Uh -huh. And I'm also on Twitter as Tori Bird. Awesome. Okay, before I let you go, I just have one very last question. What is your favorite kind of cake? Besides UX cake, oh. obviously. <laughs> so my, I, in general, I like chocolate cake with absurdly thick and sugary icing. And let me give a plug for the cake, uh, the bakery that I got my cake from. 
for every pro major professional event since I've been in Seattle, low these 20 plus years, Boracini's Bakery. I have not on, heard of that. Oh my goodness, Boracini's <laughs> Bakery okay. on Rainier Street makes and decorates fantastic cakes. They also have other pastries. I don't care, it's all about the cake. <laughs> Go get the cake. <laughs> well, that is a great recommendation for those of us in Seattle or anyone who comes to visit Seattle. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been really fun, Tori. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. That was so insightful. I really love Tori's approach and I love how she ties the writing in UX to the effectiveness of the experience as a whole. So important. There are links in the episode description and the show notes to follow Tori and her upcoming appearances, as well as to buy her book or visit her favorite bakery. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Tori laid down some real pearls of wisdom right here that you're not going to find in her book. Just saying. We are so dedicated to bringing you quality content to help you in your work and your career. And so I really love getting your feedback that you found it useful. Thanks to each of you who have written in or tweeted or DM'd us. And thank you so much if you've rated us in Apple Podcast. We especially love to hear the comments. I haven't been keeping up in my thank yous. So thanks to Pele10 and C Chachi and SVC Seattle, such a UX ally, for your recent reviews. You can subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, but you can also subscribe to our email updates on our website at uxcake.co. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and now we have a page on LinkedIn as well. So subscribe and connect so you don't miss a bite. I know UX life can be hard. Eat more cake.